First of all, welcome. Thank you very much for all turning up. Um, I'd like to first of all acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Aurora Nation, the original custodians of the land that we are uh, on which we're meeting tonight, and we pay our respects to elders both past and present. Um, I'm going to give a brief introduction and then we're very lucky to have three eminent speakers, um, Philip Thallis, Helen Lockhead and Marcus Spiller. Um, but briefly, just to remind ourselves perhaps of why we're here, um, the, the purpose of the uh, whole festival is to stimulate discussion about who and how we make decisions about our cities. And we're very fortunate to have the three speakers that we have. Um, because tonight we're going to look a little bit more closely at the potential of large urban projects, how they come about now and how they've come about in the past, and the processes for deciding whether they should happen or not. I think it's fair to say there's an extraordinary degree of distrust of both government and of the private sector by the community at large. And I don't think this is my personal impression only. Um, uh, the recent annual Lowy Institute poll found that only 60% only of Australians and just 42% of young Australians aged 18 to 29 years of age believe that, quote, democracy is preferable to any other kind of government. I find that pretty extraordinary. And I think it's fair to say that if you ask someone on the street about the integrity or motivations of developers, uh, their regard might be even lower. And then to do the unthinkable and put these two groups together, government and big developers and construction companies, which is essentially what big urban and renewal projects often seem to be, and, well, what happens? You have people turning up to events like this on a Tuesday night. Um, now, at the same time, I think there's really no question that we all recognise that we need to renew our city. Um, as economy, technology, living and working patterns change. We generally recognise the need for renewal and intensification. Most people see the desirability of compact cities and demand more infrastructure. And just last night, um, Lucy Ellis uh, from the Reserve Bank was saying how attractive our higher density inner cities are. And last week, as part of this series, uh, Professor Emily Tallon was talking about how difficult it was to achieve compact, walkable and affordable areas because the first two aspects, compact and walkable, are so attractive they make compact, walkable areas unaffordable. Um, so I know, you, you've heard all these words or similar words many times before in the introductions to the innumerable metropolitan strategies and plans that never seem to result in infrastructure. But when we do hear about infrastructure, it seems to be a mixed blessing. We demand it and then we don't like it, or we think it's in the wrong place, or we think it's the wrong type. And for some reason, West Connex and the East West Link in Melbourne perhaps might spring to mind. But the question then becomes, look, given this lack of trust in, of, of government, of developers and the construction industry, when they get their heads together behind closed doors, <clears throat> sealed by commercial in confidence agreements, we rightly suspect they're up to something. So while a high proportion of the popula population doesn't seem to have much faith in democracy, we call for more of it when it comes to urban projects. <laughs> so in short, we seem to know what we want reasonably well and the government and development industry would argue they're trying to hard, very hard to provide it. Um, so the problem, and this is what this whole festival is about, really is the problem may be in the way we plan and deliver it. So the processes, in other words. Uh, but tonight, let's hear more about the potential of these projects and how they're evaluated and then next week, as it happens, we'll be looking at some alternative planning approaches in the Sydney Lower Town Hall. So first of all, I'd like to introduce Helen Lockett. Helen is a, uh, an architect and urban designer, an adjunct professor at this university, and also deputy government architect. She's recently returned from uh, the United States, where she was the 2014 Lincoln Loeb Fellow at Harvard Graduate School of Design and at the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy. 
Her career, as probably many of you know, has focused on the inception, design and planning of complex multidisciplinary projects, ranging from a five-year city improvements program for the City of Sydney to major urban renewal and waterfront projects. So who better to talk about the catalytic potential of urban projects? Helen. Thanks, Rod. Um, hi, everybody. Um, Rod asked me to speak about some work I did uh, a number of years ago. And so hopefully I'll be able to tie it into what we're talking about here in Sydney now and draw some lessons that are relevant. Um, the increasing speed and scale of urban development around the globe means that much of our urban environment is being shaped by mega projects. Mega projects such as large scale urban renewal and transport infrastructure have the power to transform a place, a precinct and a city. They have the potential to have a catalytic impact and deliver multiple benefits beyond the project. But frequently these projects do not deliver on their promise. Regularly they result in collateral damage that includes cost blowouts, social dislocation, divided communities and broader impacts not envisaged. Recently, it's been recognised that many contemporary models of project delivery being singular and monolithic in their purposes are problematic. And as a consequence, a range of different approaches are being tested that are more flexible and diverse, inclusive and adaptable to change. So this talk, and I, I will profile a range of initiatives and interventions that have had a multiplier effect on the places they inhabit, delivering both planned and unforeseen benefits. I'll be drawing on a number of case studies from my Churchill Fellowship research in North America and Europe, and will identify some of the contributing factors that have enhanced social, economic, and environmental benefits of those places beyond expectations. And more importantly, these exemplars provide replicable lessons for other cities, including Sydney. So managing urban growth and housing and affordability, inclusion and economic vitality is an enormous challenge in major cities around the world. Essential to getting it right is understanding what is needed to temper the relentless juggernaut of growth with our competing desires for a better city for everyone that also sustains the inherent attributes of the places we value. So urban regeneration to me is key. It's key because most of the world um, will be living in cities in 2050. They're also the economic engines of most national economies these days, but they also generate a huge amount of GHG emissions. So we really need to focus on the built environment that exists to ensure that when we are building the city of the future, it is sustainable. In some cities around the world, uh, such as New York, 85% of the built environment is already existing. And so it goes on that we need to really work on regeneration, not renewal. So I'd like to talk about the factors that contribute to the development of successful and sustainable urban development. I looked at a number of cities on my fellowship, London, Copenhagen, Malmö, Stockholm, I don't need to go through them. But most of these cities set new benchmarks and demonstrated innovation in tackling the challenges of balancing environmental and social sustainability with economic growth. And you can know just from this list list here that these are all vibrant um, and economically buoyant cities. What I found was they provided valuable lessons, and I'm not going to go through them, but essentially they were inclusive, livable and accessible, locally distinctive, ordinary and extraordinary, and ultimately resilient. So what is it about these places that delivered that we would like to aspire to too? First of all, the significance of a vision. Nearly all these cities began with a very simple question, what kind of city do we want? How will we make it better for everybody? And each of them had a project champion with the, the um, mandate to drive it. Sometimes it was one person, sometimes it was many. But each of them had someone who had the power to make it happen. I mean, for example, these are the sorts of things which often stay in um, PR documents or strategic planning documents. But what I'd like to talk about is how they actually then get translated on the ground with clear benchmarks, clear targets and, and, and ways to um, demonstrate it. So, for example, in New York, um, Ned Bloomberg had a very clear vision, but he also had an amazing um, panel of commissioners who were able to deliver on planning, transport, design, parks and recreation, who were all amazing champions as well. They made huge inroads under his um, uh, 
what would you say, I don't know, under his period of, of tenure, um, with Plan NYC articulating a wide range of initiatives across 10 goals, including housing a million more people in more affordable and sustainable neighbourhoods, and 95% of those within 10 minutes of a subway and a park. And in New York, I mean, not in New York, and in Chicago, um, they really put their money where their mouth was. And I'll talk about that in some examples. This, all, all of these cities started with a vision that identified shared values, needs, and aspirations of the people and the citizens of the city. The imperative we here was to maximize value and benefits. The values included economic, cultural, social, and environmental, not just fiscal or development value. Um, but it's not enough to have a vision. You need to be able to ensure you can roll it out. And therefore, achieving the vision requires alignment of political will, policies, plans, projects, and procurement to deliver it. These need the support of community as well as private sector engagement. But if they do, extraordinary benefits at every scale can be achieved. For example, in London, the opportunity to shift growth from cent central London to the east was recognised by both Red Ken Livingston and by his successor, Conservative Mayor Boris Johnston. The ability for both of these mayors, despite their political persuasion, to stay on course because of this strategic planning, which was long term and big picture, uh, is incredibly important to remember. Um, they also recognised the importance of a suite of strategies that can be delivered by many players. London had an agenda for revitalisation of the deprived Southeast Corridor as early as the 1980s, and it was incrementally being rolled out. This forward planning put them in incredibly good shape to springboard into the delivery of the 2012 Olympics, with many policies and plans in place, and a vision of a future legacy that it could create. Plans like this look quite dull, but in fact, they're incredibly robust and map out a very strong future, which was then, as we can see, um, happening now in southeast London, um, being rolled out. It encompassed ambitious environmental, London 2012 then went on to encompass ambitious environmental commitments and targets, but also included a broad social and economic agenda. It embraced regeneration of the surrounding areas and waterways as well, providing open space, new town centres, housing, new schools, employment, and new rail and cycle networks. The Olympics provided the impetus to accelerate many initiatives that other would, otherwise would have taken years to realise, but also to push best practice and embed commitments in delivery plans. Government was able to mandate a diverse range of strategies through design, procurement and construction. So again, um, government as a leader and, set, and leading by example was incredibly pivotal to the success. Requirements included 20% renewable energy and at least 30% affordable housing in all new development. In addition, unique community infrastructure was provided, and this included a new 24-7 educational campus to meet wider community needs. Learning from previous regeneration programs, London was determined that the Olympic investment would not only focus on the project site, but also create a wave of regeneration in the surrounding communities. It, is, it focused on places as well as connectivity. It's estimated the Olympic fringe projects, the Olympic fringe has the capacity to deliver as many benefits to the surrounding area as the site, the Olympic site itself and Stratford City, with an additional 15,000 um, housing units, 10,000 jobs and an up to 70,000 more residents. So a suite of initiatives, policies, projects were developed that provided revitalized places and improved connectivity. Connected to transport, and, and this was not only connected um, into the system, but connecting places which were formerly deprived of good public transport. Um, Multifunction projects delivering through multi-agencies, um, local government, as well as state and federal, um, and in the short, medium and long term. Policies such as the East London Green Grid, which became the All London Green Grid, a citywide green infrastructure strategy, which enhances flood resilience, biodiversity, um, mitigating urban heat island, enhancing health and well-being through public open space, pedestrian and cycle networks, was absolutely key to improving the urban quality of the environment in southeast London. But it also then rolled down into more um, place-specific projects, such as the Lower Lee River Park, a continuous, generous, multifunction route along the Thames to the Olympic Park, which will complete a 40-kilometre metropolitan river park. So this is all part of the Greater London Green Grid, but it shows you how, from having a strategic vision, 
planning and, and um, projects, procurement and delivery um, benchmarks are all important to actually getting something on the ground. But also leading by example. Um, I talked about the, the stewardship of, of, um, of mayors in this, but it's not just um, uh, mayors that take the lead. Um, this government can be a city builder as well as the private sector, and it can promote sustainability and design excellence. Um, in Chicago, for example, the environmental agenda was reinforced by many documents and initiatives. The 2008 Climate Action Plan established a roadmap to 2020, and here the city walked the talk. It, after prototyping the first green roof on City Hall, and many of you may have seen the heat mapping that's been done of this particular example, where they, they um, only put a green roof on half of it so that when they did the, the heat mapping, you could see the difference between the asphaltic roof and the green roof in terms of um, uh, the heat island impacts. Um, with that, they were able to convince a take-up rate of um, more than 2 million square metres of green roofs throughout the city, um, and, and, and therefore... Um, you know, lead by example. Of course, the biggest green roof that they were able to get off the ground was the Millennium Park, which many of you would know. The largest green, the city's largest green roof, and I think maybe one of the world's largest green roofs, transformed an urban scar, which was this large car park um, and rail corridor, which separated the city from the river. I'm oh, sorry, not the river, the lake. Um, it was turned into a huge asset. It had an immediate and catalytic effect on the precinct and urban life in downtown Chicago. And many of you who have been there in recent years would know how vibrant this place is day and night. Through a public-private partnership, this $470 million project was funded half by private benefaction and half by city bonds. It, it was a hugely um, successful project and resulted in investment of an annual $1.4 billion in direct visitor spending and 78 million in tax revenue, as well as 1.4 billion in residential development generated over 10 years. So not only is good public investment, good public infrastructure um, good for its purpose, it's good for the city in very many other ways, which are not necessarily envisaged at the outset. Incentives are very important to get buy-in to the sustainability agenda, as well as to the idea of live a livable city. Through rebates, incentives, bonuses, and using procurement strategies, we can, pro we can promote agendas, long-term agendas, which make our cities more livable. Carrots and sticks were used in this particularly compelling example, which many of you would know, the High Line in New York. Working with stakeholders to deliver multiple benefits for the community, public domain, and affordable housing, for landowners and developers, uplift, for the city, design excellence, environmental benefits, economic regeneration and tourism. And this was all through urban acupuncture and retrofitting conviviality. This private freight line was in a state of degeneration, and stretch, stretching for over three kilometres um, on the west side of Manhattan. This disused privately owned rail line was overgrown and threatened with demolition when the locals got up in arms. In a true public-private partnership, the Friends of the Highland mounted a convincing argument that the new tax revenues created by the public space would, create, would be greater than the costs of construction. This has been borne out with a subsequent master plan and zoning of the special West Chelsea district. And I think it's, this is a quite a compelling um, use of like not only public infrastructure um, improving the area itself, but also having a catalytic impact. It catalyzed the transformation of a gritty industrial area into a vibrant neighborhood. Building on the existing DNA, it now has an extraordinary ecological park complete with woodland and plazas, a dynamic mix of uses that complement the burgeoning gallery district, as well as a thousand new affordable units and some world-class architecture. To date, over 35 development parcels have been have been redeveloped. And through the transfer of floor space from the development site, which was the uh, actual High Line, to the adjoining avenues. Um, and also, in addition to that, the additional floor space incorporated inclusionary zoning for affordable housing, as well as a requirement for design excellence. So it was a win-win. The outstanding public domain that's resulted for all of those of you who know it, is one of the most beautiful urban experiences in New York. But big ideas can also be developed in small bites. The vision can be implemented by many players, and I think it 
not only can be, it must be, um, and over periods of time. Because cities aren't built overnight, they take many years to unfold. And a range of new, addition, uh, new initiatives that are clearly endorsed um, is the first step. Small steps may include recapturing um, unused roadways, such as the 40,000 square feet of road area in the dense neighborhood of Lower Manhattan, which was um, retrieved for pedestrian usage and now becoming permanent. The same in Times Square or even the Boston Piers or, or temporary markets. New transport options such as the 300 miles of new cycleways in New York, again capturing more roadway for pedestrians and cyclists, as well as mandating affordable housing um, in all new housing development. So all these small incremental um, actions make for a more livable and sustainable city and happen step by step, piece by piece. In southeast London, while we had the mega projects of the Olympics, the transport infrastructure projects uh, as well, they provide a catalyst for major urban renewal, but it's also the smaller fine grain projects that demonstrate the importance of understanding and valuing what is there and working with the community and identifying and releasing the potential within. It is clear that through smaller interventions and a rolling project list, as well as new skills development for local communities and cultural programming, socially and culture, culturally rejuvenating urban regeneration can be achieved incrementally long after the Olympics has left town. And here we have an example in Hackney Wick, one of the most dense um, populations of artists in the whole of Europe, uh, supposedly, where they collaborated with the authorities, local community, to develop a distinctive character to this precinct and also spearhead its, its um, rejuvenation. It's a collaboration between government, private sector, and local community. But it was also um, partnered with longer horizon planning, which is uh, you know, traditional planning mechanisms using uplift and value capture to deliver permanent infrastructure, including social housing, and um, such as this little photograph here, this social housing, and as well as public amenities. So it wasn't just small, incremental, um, short-term projects, these are partnered with long-term bigger picture strategies as well, even in these smaller revitalization projects which partner and, and spin off as satellites from the mega projects. So in real terms, they're not self-referential, these mega projects, they're actually the, exactly the opposite. They're catalytic because they actually spur on the potential revitalization of the areas around them. In Denmark, the Carlsberg Brewery um, was very insular in terms of its disconnect from the, the surrounding neighbourhood. But in the early stage of development, a fine grain approach was taken to the urban renewal, which was very different from large scale projects like Oristad. Here the imperative has been to work with what exists and interpret the existing identity of the area that surrounds it to inform the future plan and character. And it developed into an evolving arts precinct, which is a vibrant day and night long before the urban redevelopment started to take place. And so therefore it reintegrated both socially and physically this former enclave behind high brick walls into its surrounding context. But of course, small, <coughs> steps are only part of the solution. And of course, huge leaps are absolutely essential to make um, a big headway. Harnessing the opportunities of major events, such as the Olympics, to deliver exponential transformation is key, or perhaps a federally funded infrastructure project, or even, as I found out more recently, post-disaster recovery, such as the rebuilding of Christchurch or um, the rebuilding after post um, Hurricane Sandy in New York City, which I was involved in. All these are key to delivering exponential transformation. If we don't take these opportunities when they come our way, we really are losing the moment. From these, we can have long-term legacies. And again, I would really contrast the London example, the Barcelona example, with the Sydney example where the opportunity of the Olympics was really used to catalyze change in the surrounding areas in a most extraordinary way. The top 20% of the most deprived areas of London exist around it, existed in the Thames Gateway. And so the opportunity was not only to revitalize those areas surrounding it, but also the, you know, the whole of that gateway right down, um, up and down the Lower Lee Valley. 
Um, there were great ambitions in terms of green enterprise district, 80% reduction in carbon emissions, decentralized heat networks, as well as waste management, which was different from the rest of the city. So it wasn't just about livability, it was about a different kind of city for the future. But then it translates into city plans around public housing, the rejuvenation of um, city centres around transport hubs. And these are examples that I visited in Newham, Canning Town, um, London, Riverside and Barking, all having transformational impacts and catalysed by that major, major project. But also it could be major um, infrastructure like transport. And here we have in Boston a very different example um, which was pivotal in, re in driving the re regeneration of downtown Boston. This was a major federal improvement project, the I-90, the major north-south highway running from north to south of the United States, but it also ran through Boston's downtown. It was seen as a highway project, singular and monocultural in its vision, um, and everyone objected. The proposed expansion was going to sever the city from the waterfront even more and it consolidated community action. And here I think the power of democracy is incredibly important. The community, and it's the same as in New York around the High Line, but on a much bigger scale. This was on a metropolitan scale. The community recognising the cumulative impacts of the project rightly argued the need to provide for additional benefits, including the provision of improved public transport, not just roads, um, and open space. With 20 lawsuits pending at the outside of the project, it was reimagined as an opportunity for urban renewal by the three tiers of government. The final approval mandated 75% open space, 25% for new development, and the provision of three mass transit projects, um, including new subways, um, um, by the state. Upzoning of adjacent properties has released additional tax benefits to the city, but the significant win was the public domain. By burying and widening the highway underground and creating a series of linked parks above, passing through eight city districts, this 27 hectare park, now the Rose Kennedy Greenway, connects poorer neighbourhoods that have been cut off from the city for generations, creating a new community and, and, and focus. Although this project is slowly regenerating the downtown, I would have to say the cost was phenomenal, $15 billion. Um, and therefore, it provides very and it provides very few opportunities for deep development to regenerate because there is actually such a significant amount of open space. Um, while the argument of leveraging infrastructure projects to deliver benefits to the community is undeniable, the cost versus the economic benefit on this occasion is difficult to rationalise and replicate um, elsewhere. Although I would say that it has actually transformed the downtown, but it's very difficult to replicate. So this really brings us back to how do we work with what exists? Not all projects can be transformational. We have to knit in, we have to work with, we have to incrementally do what we can. And it's often looking at the inherent attributes of the place, the small and the incidental, that energise and seamlessly integrate with their surroundings. Projects like the High Line or Hacking or Barking or Carlsberg, all in their own way and in very different ways reconnect and reimagine the places they inhabit and um, bring them into the 21st century in a way which se seamlessly um, and easily transitions from the old to the new. In Hammarby, in um, Sweden, the largest urban renewal project in Stockholm at 160 he hectares, um, this is done in a very, very compelling way. It's enabled the development to be an extension of the city, but with a focus on the water. It has many attributes which are similar to the Braes precinct. The character of inner city Stockholm, the mix of uses, the density, the street grid, and the typical six to eight storey scale of buildings have been fused with contemporary imperatives for environmental performance, better residential amenity, community infrastructure, and public spaces around the water and throughout the neighbourhoods. While the city is the project sponsor, 80% of Hammerby is being developed and delivered by a mix of developers and architects through housing competitions, both big and small, um, and that includes aged and student housing as well. And it's all done through a competitive design and development process. And it has, developed, has delivered, I don't know how many of you have been there, a very rich and diverse neighbourhood or part of the city. 
and yet it does feel contemporary, but also an, an authentic extension of the city it inhabits. So unlike the monocultures created by many large-scale urban renewal projects, Hammerby has an extraordinary cohesion and sense of community, as well as diverse green infrastructure. Which brings me to the value of nature in the city. Maintaining and restoring natural systems, biodiversity and local ecologies has significant environmental, aesthetic and recreational benefits, but it also augments the city's sense of place, its, its, its um, infrastructure and climate resilience. At Hammerby, it turned a wasteland into a high density, high amenity, high and, a, and a community with high environmental credentials through ecology, bioremediation, biofiltration, um, wetlands and green roofs. Um, at Fresh Kills Park in New York City, the largest landfill in the world was transformed into the largest park created in, in 200 years. And not only that, it actually contributes to the economy of the state through its methane generation to over 20,000 homes on Staten Island. But it can be smaller projects as well, such as the Brooklyn Piers, which have all been um, turned up back to green space, the, um, the, Bond the Boston Artery Project, which I talked about, the prairies created in Chicago, or, of course, the, the High Line that I talked about earlier. But all these projects would not have been possible without tapping into the community aspirations and needs. It's not just about looking at the bottom line. It's not just about what is going to generate the best economic development. It's about understanding the needs of the community, social, cultural, the need for diversity, the need for design excellence, the need for beauty. What I found at many of these places and many of these mega projects, if it wasn't beautiful, it was not happening. There was no sense of place. There was no sense of um, activity or vibrancy. The places which actually ha had that, the ordinary and the incidental and the extraordinary and the serendipitous were the most beautiful and successful and innovative urban environments I experienced. So a key to revitalization without gen gentrification that alienates existing communities is bringing everyone to the table and bringing them to the table often and, at the and from the beginning. This kind of public planning process requires a great investment of time and resources of city governments and developers, but without this investment, the result is often inequitable, developer-led urban revitalization. Cities have to form diverse, inclusive partnerships, foster openness and, collabor and collaborate on goals and outcomes. Moreover, we need to demonstrate the benefits of doing business this way. And we're talking about the business of city making. So many delightful things can happen from this approach. The City of Copenhagen's sustainability tool includes 14 considerations, which includes, of course, predictably things like energy, water, transport, life cycle, and the rest, but also social diversity, city space, city life, identity, business service, um, the city's project and the durability um, and sustainability of the project. So the idea that city life and um, and social diversity and city space are all part of their benchmarks in terms of measurement is absolutely key to the outcomes that they get on the ground. Um, they, they talk to the, the stakeholders, the decision makers are all involved in an iterative assessment process to achieve an agreed outcome. Breaking down silos of decision making and being people centred is seen as key to better urban outcomes. And this inclusive integrated approach has yielded multiple benefits for the city making and making it a much more livable city. Look at this example, the renewal of the sewage and stormwater systems that was, was used as an opportunity to transform the once polluted industrial harbour into a recreational focus complete with swimming bars during the summer and new waterfront parks and quality development. And anyone who's been there and seen the actual floating swimming pools that they bring in during the summertime, um, it's just fantastic. We take it for granted in Sydney, but this is a city that turned its back on the water um, all year round. And it's absolutely delightful. But not only that, they provide high quality housing that is well designed, affordable and suitable for all state phases of life. And this is standard fare. There are kids, there are teenagers, there are old people, there are families, there are singles, there are uh, everyone. Um, is included and everyone has access to high quality housing wherever they are in the city. But there is no silver bill, bullet. 
Ultimately, the most effective approaches to managing city growth involve many initiatives by many players. It involves us, it involves the city, it involves the development, in, it involves the development industry, but it also involves us being in, um, ensuring or needing to ensure that issues such as water, energy, transport, waste, diverse, biodiversity, social inclusion, quality of life and economic development are all parameters we need to consider. When we consider these, we can achieve cumulative benefits. So it's not about transport, it's about access, it's about connectivity, whether it's public transport, personal transport, getting a bus, um, getting a bicycle on a train, having an SMS to actually buy your ticket, or whether it's a, it's a dedicated bicycle path. Or whether it's water, it might be about changing, and might be providing better incentives, it might be about incorporating water into the public domain in a way which not only um, enhances the, the environmental quality but also the aesthetic and recreational benefits. All these things are key. But ultimately, all these initiatives um, can only develop multiple benefits if we are very aware of how they are made. The cautionary tale here is that such urban interventions also can provide unintended impacts. Big projects can often silo rather than spread the benefits, such as at London Stratford City, where Westfield, uh, which is adjacent to the Olympic site, where Westfield is the main economic beneficiary as train travellers are channeled from the new station through the mega mall to the detriment of the existing town centre. More incremental transformation can also be troubling. For example, creative communities, while seeding regeneration, um, often cause gentrification and dislocation, which Rod touched on earlier. Um, this soon follows, as evidenced in the Lon London's digital hotspot shortage. Since the 1990s, the original working class population has been gradually displaced by the creative digital community, who are now themselves being displaced by multinational IT companies, sterilising um, a once very diverse and vibrant place. The challenge for Sydney is to learn from these cities, the good, the bad, um, and the ugly. Making cities is complex. The lessons here demonstrate that a shared vision, cleared strategies, collaboration and commitment to implementation over the long term are key to success. If we adopt many of these lessons, it will provide a robust roadmap for the delivery of our infrastructure and urban planning priorities. However, if Sydney aspires to be one of the most vibrant, livable cities in the world, we also need to ensure that the remit is to create a sustainable, diverse, inclusive and enriching place for all Sydney-siders to live. Thank you.